And now, without any further today, let's, let's begin today's e-commerce event, Logistics, Shipping, and Distribution. I'd like to introduce your moderator for today, Suzette Hudson, Senior Advisor Investment Promotions for the Caribbean Export Development Agency. Suzette, you now have the floor. Thank you, Caroline. Hi, good morning, everybody. Good morning to all our um, Caribbean businesses and, and, and firms who have joined on to hear this, our very last e-commerce, I know, our very last e-commerce webinar session. Um, it may be our last webinar session, but it's not our last effort to support the, the, your, your, your drive towards e-commerce. So, so stay tuned and you'll hear a little bit more about what we're planning to do next. But we're very happy to have you um, for this session. If this is the first time you're joining us, we have been having a series of e-commerce webinars. This is our fourth. Um, today, we'll be looking at logistics in terms of shipping and distribution. But just to give you an idea of what we've done before, um, we had our very first episode with the e-commerce um, training academy. We had Mr. Ala Hassan speaking on how to transform your business with e-commerce. And he looked at how to succeed online this year, despite the coronavirus. He looked at the launch, um, how to launch an online store in three, in eight simple steps. He looked at how to promote your business with digital marketing. And all of that information is available on our website. I've put the website link there for you. Um, and all the, the information from this webinar will also be available at that link. We also had an opportunity for firms to win coaching sessions with ALA. And these are the three firms that won that session um, coming out of our first episode. Our second one was held um, two, what was it, two weeks ago. Um, it was on June 12th, and we looked at developing a viable e-commerce strategy. And our, our, our presenter there um, for that session is also our main presenter for this session. Um, it, his name is Gilbert Williams, and he is a CEO and founder of the company Ethniv, where they specialize in e-commerce. And he looked at defining your, your e-commerce strategy in terms of your objectives, your target market, being export ready, how to, 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 to make your, your goods operational, how to make your business operationally ready for the global market, how to support your services and with strategic interventions, um, and what, do, what could your budget for your e-commerce strategy look like. And then our very last webinar, which was last week Friday, looked at e-commerce solutions and the e-commerce solutions that we focused on were, were um, your website and we also looked at your e-payment platform. And there, um, Gilbert led the discussion again, um, along with our colleagues, um, Lewis from CXP, um, as well as Tira. And that was such, Tira was, is a ICT attorney. And that was such an eye-opening conversation looking at whether the Caribbean is ready for e-commerce and what were some of the policies that were in place. I'm sure we had, we learned a lot from that. Um, you know, just to let you know that at the end of every session, we push out a survey and we're asking that you fill out the survey so that we can know if what we've provided in terms of information and training was good for you. You know, if this, if this met your need and if it didn't, to tell us what we could do to improve on that. And we have um, opportunities for you to win um, three more coaching sessions, this time with Ethniv. And there's also an opportunity for you to be one of our demonstration projects working with CXP. So if you please go on as soon as we're done, just fill out that questionnaire. You have an opportunity to win coaching sessions and to also be a demonstration project receiving handholding from the company that offers the, the e-payment platform that we discussed last week. I'm Suzette Hudson, and I work with Caribbean Export Development Agency. My primary responsibility is investment promotion, but e-commerce has become one of the projects that I work on in the area of export promotion and trade development. And I work with a team that is really excited about bringing this to the Caribbean people to make sure that you're supported during this time and that you're able to get your products out to the market. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with 
Caribbean export. Um, I have to tell you a little bit about us so that you can come to us when you have a need. Uh, we work in 15 CARIFORUM countries in the area of export promotion and trade development, in the area of investment promotion. We work um, in 23 Caribbean countries. And our mission, of course, is to enhance the competitiveness of the Caribbean brands. Um, we want to deliver transformational and targeted intervention, particularly as it relates to export development and investment promotion. So most of our funding comes from the European Union, and I want to take this opportunity to thank our colleagues from the European Union for partnering with us. When we told them that we wanted to do e-commerce, it was not on our work or original work program, they were willing to accommodate. So thank you very much for being a development partner in the true sense of the word. And we also work with the CARICOM Secretariat, um, and they too have been a significant support for this. What we do, it's there on the slide, our main sec segments that we, we focus on are agro-processing, the creative industries, um, specialized tourism, manufacturing, ICT, and renewable energy. We offer support in terms of, um, you know, preparing you to enter the market, ensuring that when you get in the market, you meet the right clients, um, taking you to trade missions, but most importantly, the training component, capacity building, is really integral because we teach you how to earn money, how to increase your revenues, how to export. Um, and that's what we're doing today in this webinar. So today, please sit back, take out your pen and paper. We're going to be talking about shipping and distribution. You'll hear from our expert, expert panel. They will talk about the challenges, and we have quite a few in the Caribbean but we often don't talk about the opportunities and the possibilities that despite the challenges, there are ways to get business done. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Gilbert and his team will be helping us to do just that. And who do we have um, talking with us besides Gilbert, who you've met? I'm sure that you're tired to see Gilbert. He's on every week. Um, Gilbert, thank you very much for joining us. Just a little bit on him. He has been delivering decades, uh, for the last two decades, he's been delivering solutions for not only the MSMEs, but also the government agencies and NGOs. Um, and he has been doing this across three continents, you know, so it's not, he doesn't work only in North America. Um, his, his work has primarily been focused in the area of e-commerce. And so he is ably placed to talk to us about this. Um, we also have with us Ricardo, and Ricardo is Chairman and Managing Director of Caribbean Aviation Logistics Group, SwiftPak. We, we're, we're very familiar with that company. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about Ricardo, you can see his bio on your panel, and you can scroll down and read through everything there. But just to know that, you know, Ricardo has seen SwiftPak as his special project, and his aim as a professional he is to, to integrate the Caribbean supply chain via a common marketplace to offer logistic services by air, ocean, throughout the Caribbean. Ricardo has also been gracious enough to put his phone number on, on, on his profile, so please feel free to make a note of that. And we also have with us um, Andre Rob, and Andre is the Young Leaders of the Americas um, Fellow, he he was that he earned that um, accolade in 2018. He's a co-founder and CEO of Brata Box and Company out of Jamaica, and they curate items made by local artisans and makers who wish to expand their customer base through e-commerce. We're very happy to have this very distinguished panel with us. And so, without further ado, I am going to hand over to Gilbert who's going to walk us through um, the presentation and help us to understand a little bit more about how to make e-commerce work for us in terms of shipping and distribution. Gilbert? Hi, good morning and welcome back to our third and hope it's not the final session um, on e-commerce in the Caribbean. Today's agenda, we're gonna be talking about, I would introduce the topic of logistics one second. Uh, receiving, warehousing, pick, pack, deliver, and returns. Um, Ricardo will be speaking about logistics from the perspective of a logistics company, and Andre, who runs an e-commerce company, 
would walk you through what the process is actually like for an e-commerce company. Uh, Susan so already introduced us, so you know exactly who we are. And our previous sessions, as she mentioned before, and we have our first survey question. One second. Much better. Yeah, um, so we have our first survey questions. So when we think about logistics, most companies do not, or a lot of companies do not take into consideration the return process. That's critical. It's critical because it's an integral part of your customer service and that um, last mile relationship, the last dance, not the last dance, but the dance before our next purchase, or for the customer's next purchase. So it's very important that you incorporate return into your process. And thinking about return also affects your pricing. How do you price your product? Do you price your product so that you're able to afford a return? Return has to be taken into consideration on a, on a policy level. Um, I know right now in the Caribbean, we do not have uh, a significant amount of, although there are policies, I mean, from our research, we, have met, we haven't gone to a particular, any particular country that doesn't have a return policies. But those policies are not typically enforced. And as a region, we do not practice return. Um, a lot of people would purchase stuff, and if they're dissatisfied with it, they tend to just want to eat that dissatisfaction. But that, is, that, is, that will change. It is going to change because the e-commerce world, and when you shop in first world countries and you see what their return process is like, it would be implemented in the Caribbean. But it goes both ways. The policies have to protect the businesses as well as the consumers because we do have consumers who abuse the, the, the return process. Someone would buy something and continue to buy them, return them, use them, return them, use them, return them. Especially now that we have what is called um, no refund returns. So if you buy a product, you don't like it, you get to keep the product and the company typically owes you the money that you spent on it. Uh, so there has to be policies that are put in place to protect businesses when it comes to returns as well. Um, we up to 30% response in the poll. We're trying to get to a 50%. So please, if you can, tell us where you are in this, if you have this included in your process at all. It's, as I said, it's a critical part in closing the deal, not for this particular purchase, but for the follow-on purchases. Um, some of the things that we suggest, even if you have a return, is that you don't just accept that return. You accept the return, communicate with your, your, your consumer, your customer, and offer them something on their next purchase. So it doesn't feel like if you're just there for you know, their hard-earned money. You're actually there to service them, so you treat them well. Um, okay, the poll isn't moving much, so we're going to go on. So, Caroline, if you can give us the results of those polls, that would be great. Okay, good. So we have, most people do not have a logistics plan. Okay, this is critical. We do have 25% that has return built into that process. And 19% that says, no, we do not have a return. So those numbers are critical. Those numbers are big numbers. So we're looking at close to 75% that do not have return built into any sort of a plan. All right. Um, so... Logistics, which is known in the e-commerce world as fulfillment, and this is sealing the deal. This is, as I said, this is where you, you, you signed off on a, on a delivery, on a, on a purchase, and you prepare yourself for the next during this conversation, right? When you look at this, so let me step back a minute. When you look at e-commerce, e-commerce is no different from a real world brick and mortar business. It's a solid business plan made efficient with the use of technology, right? Or enhanced with the use of technology. So you have to have a plan in place for every step of your processes, right? This conversation is the last part of the conversation. The entire delivery process is a conversation where you communicate with your consumers through action and through words, where you communicate with your couriers through action and through words. So... Logistic fulfillment, right, involves several steps. Receiving products are components from your suppliers. So let's say you are receiving pro um, products that are already made and that you're just going to sell. So let's say you're a supermarket and you're getting products from different producers, whether it's local or whether it's international, whether it's regional. 
you stop those you sell them over or if you if you're making something if you're manufacturing and you're receiving components within that for for that product that that final product right you still need to receive those and you still need to um, sort them inventory them stock them storing and warehousing this is the other part of this so after you receive them you have to store them so you have to have a system in place that says this is where i put um my shoes this is where i put my my handbags that type of stuff or where i put my components picking and packing there's an accuracy that is involved in that that needs to be addressed and planned for the delivering delivering process whether that's a customer picking it up or you sending it out via courier um processing returns again we just went on at length about that and outsourcing logistics so you don't want to have to deal with the logistical side of it so you want to outsource that inventory management integration this has to be a part of the system every step of the way we touched it we touched on this in our previous sessions it's critical to have some sort of inventory management um proper inventory, inventory management is mandatory separated inventory based on channel so the last session we spoke about the different e-commerce channels that you could use which were um marketplace your own website or mobile e-commerce right manual uh, inventory management integration so this is where you probably just um you have to have some sort of record keeping system but this is where you enter that information manually a lot of companies still do that in the caribbean because we do understand that inventory management tools can be costly right but it's also very inefficient especially if you do in multi channel e-commerce which is what we recommend um automated inventory management uh, which is usually tied to a point of sale system So this is where you use a a tool, a piece of software, and you inventory everything coming into your business and going out. We do recommend a complete ERP system which would involve inventory management, point of sales, sales management, purchase management. So you could understand that if you're doing if you're looking for something that is highly efficient, which is te- which is what technology is supposed to do with your business, increase the efficiency. purchase management is is critical inventory management is critical a point of sales and sales management all the same data analysis and reporting is what directs your logistics decisions and how you allocate your, your scarce resources and it's critical that you take feedback from your end consumer about delivery experience so you have to find a way to um curate all these records from your data analysis to your inventory to feedback from you can this this is going to drive how you direct your logistics planning the receiving process so you receive stuff this is just an image i'm going to go into the words of this so you receive the stuff verify it so you get it you have to verify it you warehouse it you verify it again you sort in your shelf you verify that again and inventory management has to be consistent and constant throughout the entire process receiving know precisely what you're receiving so based on your order or your order management from your manufacturer or supplier you have to know exactly what you're receiving right know precisely when you're receiving it timing is is very critical in logistics okay let's say i'm receiving a shipment and i don't currently have space set aside for that shipment that is bad right so you need to know when you're receiving it so you make all the necessary preparation know precisely how much you're getting sometimes you have shortages and you have overage you need to account for those things know precisely how they will be delivered are they coming by a um a taxi are they coming by a tractor trailer what what are they coming by you have to make preparations for those things have insurance insurance is key you may never use it but not having it is detrimental plan to the minute detail of receiving plan everything down to the last detail verification inventory update has to be constant as we mentioned before all along the way you have to account for everything that you receive or didn't receive it all sounds as i said basics fundamental this is uh, ordinary business but when you think it a shrinkage which involves um damages uh lost the product or lost the products um products being stolen products being misplaced account for 15% of lost Yeah, so you lose 15% of what you actually spend on the products through shrinkages. So you have to make sure that accountability is in place every step of the way. 
storing and warehousing, examine and verify what you have received. We mentioned that before, and I'm going to continue to repeat myself because these things are critical. They come if you don't put these things in place. Three key tools, inventory management, warehouse management, and purchase management. Purchase management, because now I understand, I know exactly what I purchase and who I purchase it from, and I know exactly what I'm getting. As it gets into my space, I have an inventory management system that inventories that, and a warehousing management that says exactly where I stored what. So that is going to be important when it comes to picking and packing to increase that efficiency. The fact that I know exactly where things are, I can quickly go and get them. Um, I know a number of small businesses, maybe there's a few who have the same cuts out of budget Amazon does, I'm not sure. But if you do, then you have this whole system automated with robots. For most of the people that I'm speaking to today, I'm sure that you do not have that in place. So you need to do this in a semi-manual, semi-automated way. Sort and store per sales channel. So let's say you're doing um, your own e-commerce site, you're doing um, a platform or a marketplace, and you're doing mobile, separate your inventory. That is unless you have a very good inventory management tools in place, which would integrate these, integrate these seamlessly. Update, the, update your inventory and your suppliers. So after your inventory has been updated, if there were any shrinkages, if there were any damages, if there were any missing, you need to immediately reach out to your suppliers and let them know exactly what happened. If you have it, if they're insured, immediately reach out to your insurance company and show and let them know exactly what happened. Um, create a staging space. So as products come in, you're gonna use the staging space in two, in two instances. As products come in, you can sort them. And as products leave for picking and packing, you can also sort them and pack them there. In a lot of cases, your store is your warehouse and your shelves are your category, categorized sorted areas. This is one of the advantages. I talked about the advantages as we as Caribbean businesses have. So we have our space that we set up in our brick and mortar and we already sorted the stuff there. A consumer can actually walk in and pick the stuff off the shelf. It's already sorted. Same thing, you know, if you do an e-commerce and you have an order come in, your stuff is already sorted on shelf. You could easily go over and pick them up. We don't have to deal with an additional, a lot of small businesses do not have to deal with an additional warehousing, which is an additional cost, right? So your store is actually your warehouse. Treat your store just like your warehouse to make sure that everything is properly sorted on shelves. Picking, packing, and labeling. So you have a staff that picks and packs. Order and product are verified and inventory is updated. So you get an order online. We went through this process last week. I'm going to go over it again. You get an order online. It comes to, you get an order um, an order to your, your picking and packing team. They go out, they pick it, they verify that they're packing the right stuff. They pick it and they pack it. And then your inventory is automatically updated to reflect what your current numbers are. Precision is critical. Mistakes will cost you and they may cost you customers. Packing the wrong items and sending them off could lead to a disappointing customer. Losing that particular product is cheap in comparison to losing the customer, right? So you have to have precision here. As best you can, have a product per package plan. What products are you putting in what type of package? Know this before you start the process. Efficiency is important. This step is, ne is negotiated with your courier. So you don't have to go through this alone. Um, Ricardo is going to talk about this. They have things in place where they already decided what products should go in what packages, and they would guide you on that. So speak to you, whether it's your post office or your local courier or your international courier. Talk to them about what you tell them. Hey, these are my products. What, product, what packages do you suggest I put them in? Right? Some um, logistics company like the post offices, I know, have restrictions on what you can actually put on the boxes in terms of labels because it can get confusing. Make sure you follow those guidelines. Uh, based on your return process, this is where you place the return labels in boxes. I strongly discourage putting any return labels in any box when you send it out to a customer. The psychological factor to that consumer when they do receive the box and they see a return label is, aha. I can actually return this when I'm finished with it, right? Plus, they may not. So you just wasted time printing a label, right? So the, the proper way to do the return is have a system in place online on your e-commerce e site. The last mile delivery process, one, critical. Communicate. What comes in, you're finished picking and packing. Have, communicate with your courier. That may be manual. You pick up the phone and you call them. Or in our instances, 
in our instant, when we, whenever a package, when a, an order is, well, is picked and packed, the, our, our automated system send out an alert to our couriers, depending on the size of the package, the type of delivery that was um, listed, and where it's going. So you communicate, you verify that that communication went through. The courier shows up. Uh, let me go on to the next slide. Um, and she, yes, you, yes. So the courier picks it up. You verify that. It, so the courier acts as a check and balance in your system. If you say that you're going to be delivering a particular type of package and it's going to this person, your courier is supposed to be a check and balance at that point in time. They have to verify what you say you're shipping is what is being shipped. All right, this package is going to um, Suzette Hudson in a particular address. So make sure that that is what is on the box and this is what was paid for. Communicate with the customer that this package actually left. Make sure yeah, your delivery persons are friendly, well-dressed, well-attired. Again, this entire process is a communication. It speaks volumes about your business. Um, communicate with your customer that it is on its way or it's been delivered. A happy customer is a return customer. Um, last mile delivery. Um, once the shipping label is, is, is printed, make sure that the courier is alerted. Addressing. So one of the challenges that we have in the region is that we have countries that do not have a proper addressing system. So the challenge is well, how do we deliver precise? Well, there, there, there are applications currently on it. You know, we are using an application called Tree Words. And it's where the, the entire globe is segmented into square meters. And each square meter have three words that matches that square meter. So you could actually enter three words. You could search a map, find what your three words are, enter it in our addressing system, and our delivery um, services can find you based on those addresses, based on those three words. Really, really cool system. It's not where we should stop. It's where we should start, and we can move this on to actually naming streets and house numbers. Right? But it is a start. Local delivery zones, um, along, alongside with your courier and the consultation with the courier, develop local delivery zones so that you know exactly how you're pricing your deliveries. Right? Um, within the first mile, we can do our next day delivery for $5, that type of thing. You work that out with your local couriers. Work with your post office, couriers to determine the, the zones and the prices. Delivery time, same day delivery, next day delivery, two day delivery. Standard is five to seven days and extended. This again is based on your delivery zone, whether those delivery zones are international or local. Again, here's another advantage that we have in the Caribbean. Um, Amazon has pushed the, the same day and the next day to the delivery. And it's costing not just the, the businesses that provide these products to Amazon, it's also costing the economy. There have been several accidents for people rushing products or drivers rushing products when they really don't need to. Like uh, when I look at my Amazon deliveries here, sometimes the driver comes and the only thing you see in that windscreen is the driver's head. Everything else is blocked off because he has so many packages that he's trying to deliver in a short space of time. The urgency is not real. It's not. We do not have to um, abide by that. But if you choose to, the Caribbean is uh, as have a serious advantage. Again, our islands are small. Most of our stores are small. Our products are right there on hand. We could provide same day once we provide certain cutoff times for the order. So we can say, if you put in an order before 10 a.m., we could deliver it to you by 8 p.m. that night because a lot of them are local. We could use our local transportation system, which is a, another product that we've developed at, 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 um, at Etnev, where we are using um, an Uber-like system to order delivery for products for a transportation system, for transportation, um, for drivers. That's the taxi drivers, minibus drivers who are going in that particular direction. You can request a delivery. We would request a delivery for anyone going in that direction to drop off a package. This allows us, as I said, we have the advantage in the Caribbean where our islands are pretty small in comparison like to the United States. And we can make those deliveries within the same day, next day or two day. Um, Free shipping is not really free. You have to price these things into your product because at the end of the day, you're going to be charged for it. The post office is going to charge you for those deliveries. So you have to price those into your products and offer customer pickup, pickup window times. So you can say we have pickups for orders that are placed before 10 a.m. The pickup window for orders placed at 10 a.m. is 
uh, two to four p.m. and anything after anything before two p.m. can be done between six um, four and six p.m. The return process. So a dissatisfied customer. So when you have a dissatisfied customer, you have to communicate with them. It's really, really important that you do. Set up the return process online. Uh, communicate with the courier. Again, we have an advantage with this in the Caribbean where we can do returns relatively cheap, uh, uh, cost-effective returns, uh, where we could have the courier pick up uh, any of our transportation system, pick up that package and return it to your space, to your warehousing. Refund the money, verify what you got back, and update your inventory. Communicate again with your customer. Again, this is where we advise that you, um, where you offer, you make the, the, the consumer an offer of a discount on their next purchase so that they don't feel as if they were just given a bad deal and there is no, um, then there's no reward in it for them. Avoid returns. Returns are expensive, could lead to chargebacks. So last week when we spoke about payments, chargebacks are, let's say you charge a customer for a particular product when they got it, they were dissatisfied. And rather than communicating with you, that, that, that customer reaches out to their banks and say, listen, I did not make this purchase, or the purchase that I made is not what I expected. I feel, I feel duped. I feel like if it was um, bamboozled. So the, the, the bank will now say, we're going to charge back to your account, which could lead to you not being able to process payments in the future, which could cripple your business. So satisfy your consumers, your customer. Deliver what you, they ordered. Keep your customer engagement channels open. Always communicate with them, even when you make a bad delivery. Right? Some, some customers will never be satisfied. So we know this. So policies have to be put in place to protect businesses as well as consumers. Implement a return logistics process. Spoke about that before. That's critical that you have that in place. Uh, verify your return, refund promptly, and communicate with your customers. Make them an offer. And we spoke about the no refund return. That's probably one of the worst practices, but it also forces businesses to be more efficient and way more precise. Because if you know that you sent out the product and there's a no refund return policy in place, it means, all right, I sent out the product, I'm not getting back that product, and I have to give back the consumer their money. So you pay for logistics. You pay for the product, the manufacturing, or the purchase of the products, and you're not getting back the money. Outsource any logistics. Um, 3PL, which stands for third-party logistics. So there are a number of companies, including the one that we have in line today with us, um, Ricardo from Swiftpack, that could provide you with a service. So this is how it works. So you would typically, if you have your manufacturer, you would ship your stuff to Ricardo in pallets form. Uh, whatever form you, you want to do that, in bulk. And whenever an order comes in, that order goes straight to Ricardo, whose team would pick and pack those things and ship them off to their, to their destination. Job shipment is another thing. So you do not have to touch this product at all. All you have is an e-commerce site. An order comes in, that order goes directly to the manufacturer. The manufacturer then calls the... Um, request the courier to come and pick it up and have it delivered. All you do is take a percentage for trading that product. When you're using any of these services, whether it's 3PL or job shipment, make sure you get a detailed service level agreement. Who pays for damages? Who pays for packaging? Who pays? Everything has to be covered. What are the costs for warehousing this product for the time that it is in my way? Is it in the, the 3PL's warehouse? What is that cost? Is it insured? Who pays for that insurance? get a detailed service level agreement. You still need inventory management, so you need to keep that on your website. So you need to have that fully integrated into your system, even if it's being handled by a third-party logistics company or a job shipment company. Have those information in your website, right? You still need the data analysis because you still need to do marketing, right? So you still need to know where do I allocate my funds. This is uh, some of the costs associated with the 3PL services. These are just estimates from a couple of other sites that do it, uh, other companies that do it here in the United States. Um, so a flat rate for a pallet of receiving for two hours of service is $25. 
the storage for a pallet of goods is $40. Um, the pick and pack services, there's a fee to that. Uh, the packet, the packaging, there's a fee to that. The shipping, there's a fee to that. So those are all the things that you have to take into consideration when choosing one of these 3PL services. But also know that this allows you to focus on your core competence. You do exactly what you do. You don't have to deal with the issues of logistics. You pass that on to someone else. Yes, it takes an additional um, set of funds out of your pocket, but it's an uh, it's a ease of mind. You know, it's handled by professionals. Um, I now pass it on to Ricardo, who would pick up from a logistics company perspective. But you know, um, Gilbert, before before we pass it on Hi. to on to Ricardo, um, I think maybe we uh -huh. could take a couple of questions um, that have come in to the to. Q. Great, great, great. Um, maybe get, allow Ricardo a, a minute or two to to um, to to be prepared to to speak. But the let me see a couple of questions I have here. Um, there is one that speaks about the high cost of shipping within the Caribbean. Um, they say that they say here that um, the cost of shipping internationally as well as between the Caribbean islands, how do we encourage it, the, the, the cost competitiveness? How do we ensure that um, we're able to ship at costs that are not um, that, that that do not run businesses out of out of business, just that shipping component, you know? How how do we improve yeah. on those challenges in the Caribbean? Let me let me see if I can give you one other one before before you take that one. Um, this one says, um, can you advise on a system that you have used and or are currently using that works hand in hand with purchasing logistics, receiving and inventory needs? And I guess this question is very similar. They say ARP systems such as what is what is out there for very small artisan businesses. Maybe we could take those three um, before we move yeah. on. Well, the, two, the, the, the last two are pretty much the last two questions are pretty much the same, right? So we're gonna answer. Right. We can answer that. So ARPs can be very very expensive. Mm -hmm. We spoke about this in our we spoke about these in our last sessions, mm -hmm. and the cost of ERP can run you from anywhere from three uh, from three thousand dollars to three million dollars easily and above. The best of them, they're going to cost you, and they're going to cost you significantly. But fortunately, again, um, just like I said last week, this is a shameless plug. At Etna, we have developed ERP systems specifically for Caribbean companies, Caribbean businesses, because we do know that it's expensive, but it's also critical for most efficiency. So we offer our packages of tools, which goes way beyond just the ERP. Um, Oracle has another product that's extremely expensive, also very efficient, right? But it's extremely expensive. We have manufacturing, we have logistics built into it, not just the inventory management, but um, tracking the addressing systems, the automated courier alerts based on what you have specified you want your couriers to be. Um, what else? We have manufacturing, we have authentication of your products. So one of the things that we do is we could authenticate that a product is made in the Caribbean. So for, for Caribbean people who are looking to support and patronize Caribbean businesses, you can verify that a product was actually made in any particular country by a particular vendor. So that's a great thing that we offer that most ERP don't use. And the first question on shipping. Shipping is typically a nightmare in the Caribbean. It's ridiculously expensive, right? Especially um, air shipping, when you ship by air for next day shipping, because of the taxes and the fees that you're being charged. It's ridiculous. Plus, we do not have proper hubs. I know Ricard is working on a solution where they, they've just, they're building or in the process of building off just completed a, a, a hub, a distribution hub in, in Barbados, and that takes care of the Southern Caribbean. There is a pretty good distribution hub out of St. Martin's that can be used as well. Um, but we you need to contact the 3PL services there. So you have to be willing when you're using the shipping hubs, which allows for much more efficient distribution of products and reduce costs 
of distributing those products, you have to be willing to ship those those products to those 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 three PL distribution places and have them sit there and pay those fees. But when you think about it, what it does for your business is absolutely worth it. When you're pricing your products again, you have to price your products taking those into consideration. Now. Um, the people in authority have to put policies in place that drive these costs down, a reduction in taxes, right? Uh, we have to start looking at our local schooner system, so the boats that traverse the Caribbean, and we say, oh, these are pretty small. But we have in the, in the smaller Caribbean countries, in the southern Caribbean countries, where we have schooner services that goes between Trinidad, Grenada, St. Lucia, regularly they deliver packages. Right? We have to look at using those, incorporating those into our system. They're efficient. They're very efficient, but we tend to look at them differently. There is no need. Right? Just like you have here in the United States where we have bicycle delivery, that is part of our system. Not everyone uses UPS and FedEx. Right? It's expensive. Yeah, it looks good, but it's expensive. So we have to look at what we have and take, make the best advantages of that, take the best advantages of that. Great, great. Thank you so much, Gilbert. Um, that was very useful. We have a lot of questions coming in into the question and answer. Um, a lot of them have to do with some of the things that I think Ricardo would address. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Ricardo. Uh, Ricardo, ready? Yes, um, I'm here. Thank you. Hello? Yeah, we can hear yes, Ricardo, Ricardo, please, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, welcome to all, and let me say a pleasant good morning to everyone in the Caribbean. Um, logistics. Uh, today we are having a conversation about logistics. Another lecture. Um, Gilbert did a fantastic job and on, on the rudimentaries of logistics, the, the areas that needs to be managed. Um, However, um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to drill down a little more into all the areas, all the facets of logistics that we may overlook and we may not even realize that we are all involved in logistics in some way, form, or fashion. Okay, first of all, let me just give you a brief definition of logistics. Um, logistics is the process of managing how products are acquired stored, transported to their final destination. And this relates to logistics management, which involves the identification of distributors and suppliers and determining their effectiveness and accessibility. In simple words, logistics involves purchasing at the right, purchasing the right amount of merchandise at the right time, getting it to the correct location in proper condition and delivering to the correct customer on time. That's a mouthful. Let's take it and simplify that. As a logistics company, we see logistics as the axis of commerce. It is upon this axis that commerce thrives. Whether or not it's e-commerce or it's just ordinary brick and mortar business. Logistics relates to procurement, first of all, and this is pretty much straightforward. It has to do with your ability to find the right product, purchase the product, and ensure that at all times you get that product at the right price. So that's critical. However, once you have purchased the product, whether or not you're a consumer or a supplier, you need all the following steps to be in place to ensure that that product gets to the final consumer and the final destination in a timely manner. 
Let's start with storage. You purchase something and you need to store it. The product type is critical to how it is stored. So you cannot purchase perishable product and store it in a warehouse that is basically not set up for storage of perishable product. Example, you may require in Barbados to purchase lobster tails from St. Vincent. You must be in touch with someone who has the capacity to store that lobster tail in the right temperature until it is ready to be transported to Barbados. And when it gets to Barbados, you must have the facility in place to store that product until you are ready to supply that product to a consumer. It is no different for consumer goods such as clothing or bags or whatever else you want to purchase. It is critical that the warehousing facility is set up in such a way to be able to store that product. And storage is directly related to warehousing. Warehousing, it's not just a building. It is a lot more than a building. Warehousing includes critically software. It includes a logical shelving process. It includes pack and pick. It includes packaging. I'll give you some very simple thoughts on warehousing that we currently do here in Miami. A customer will purchase something from a store. Let's take a cell phone. That cell phone comes to us in a box that is 12 by 12 by 12. What is the size of the cell phone? It is no more than seven inches. When you consider packaging from a warehouse standpoint, you have to consider the volume that packaging takes. So always remember that volumetric packaging will cost you. If, in short, if you put a small product in a very big box, you are likely to eventually pay for a big box and not the weight of the small product. It is always important that you be guided by the weight versus the volume. And so, in order to assist customers, we have taken the decision to provide them with specific packaging tailored to the size of articles and items and merchandise so as to reduce volume. This is no different in the US or in the Caribbean. I want you to think about sending something from Barbados to St. Vincent or from Antigua to Barbados. Right now, your options are very limited.
There are very few suppliers of warehousing in the Caribbean. And where they exist, they are not organized. And they are not organized to the point to provide inventory management. And this is what I want to come to. Inventory management is critical to e-commerce. And if we are to encourage e-commerce in the Caribbean, inventory management will become the most important aspect of your business. It will be important that, it will be important that your inventory system feeds into your logistics management system. And let me explain that to be relatively simple. Your inventory management system must be able to tell your 3PL logistics company what you have at any point in time. Better yet, it is a lot better if you can take your inventory and have an arrangement with the 3PL management to disburse your inventory. So you don't need to have warehousing. What you need to do is to have stock, but that stock is held by your, what we will call in the Caribbean, your ship. But this is a shipper of a different class. Essentially, they, once you receive an order, will pick the item that was ordered, will package that item, will prepare the label with tracking, and then ship that item and deliver it to the final consumer. Now, in that process, there are several obstacles to overcome. Transportation. Obviously, we have, we get by, I must say, in the Caribbean with certain levels of transportation. But our system is by no means perfect. It is not the best. And there's a lot to be desired. Think about it this way. If you require transportation to move a small piece of jewelry that was manufactured by a customer in St. Vincent to someone in Jamaica, how are you going to do that? What are your options? There are still very limited options in the Caribbean when it comes to moving certain items. You may try to do it by FedEx. That will cost you a lot. You will try to move it by DHL. Same problem. The other options are the passenger airlines who may or may not accept it. You will have no guarantee when it will arrive. And for sure, you are unlikely to have tracking. So your customers will not be aware of the movement of this package and will one day be surprised to find out, oh, it has arrived. That's not the level of logistics that we should be providing in the Caribbean. And it is definitely not what is desired by the customer. And so our role is to change this slowly but surely to one that is compatible to what exists in the US today. That is 
you as a customer and as a supplier, retailer, or manufacturer is kept abreast of every single action, every single movement in the supply chain until that product is delivered to the final consumer. Last mile delivery. To do that, obviously, it takes a significant set of investment, significant sums and a significant investment in property, plant, equipment, and of course, manpower. One of the major issues that we see in the Caribbean at this point, customs and customs clearance. We strongly believe that customs, while we recognize their responsibility, their very important responsibility to collect the revenues of the governments, the role of customs should not be one that impedes trade, legal trade that is, but instead customs should be a partner to encourage growth of commerce. Customs cannot be simply dependent on policing the cargo that currently comes into a country. An approach that is based on mistrust of a customer more than anything else. But instead, customs need to create a balance and also focus on encouraging volume growth and compliance by customers. This is critical. If, and I can tell you, I can give you examples of, of, of how customs are different in various Caribbean countries. But let me give you a very simple example. Some time ago, we shipped three pages of checks. Three. So on each page, there are two checks. Three pages of checks from Miami to a Caribbean country. Now, a checkbook con contains 100 checks or whatever. You pay for a checkbook, whatever. Three pages by an, in an envelope to a Caribbean country for signature. What happened? Customs stopped the shipment at entry, saying that it required an invoice. Now, so you have three pages of a checkbook, six checks that came out of a hundred that you would have paid maybe ten dollars for. So first of all, they're asking you to prepare a false envoy, because you, there's no way you can give them the, the original invoice for the checkbook. You are required to prepare a false invoice. And secondly, how much duties can be collected on checks that are valued less than a dollar? It is not only that, but you take that same two pages of checks, or three pages, and you send it by FedEx or DHL, and it is delivered to your door, free of duty. So there are disparities in the way that customs carry out their function from one island to another. In Barbados, 
if you export something that is 30 US or less from any country to Barbados, duties are not applicable. In St. Lucia, 23 US or less, duties are not applicable. Dominica, 55 US or less, duties are not applicable. Once these are not commercial goods. But there are other countries that if you, exp if you import something that is $1 in value, you will be required to pay duty. So it is very important that we understand the role of customs and we play along to ensure that we can satisfy the requirement of customs in the various countries. As an importer or an exporter, it is going to be very difficult for you to, to be maneuvering all these different processes. And so we believe that as an e-commerce provider, it is going to be very important that you work with a logistics company to ensure that your life is made easy. And secondly, you can concentrate on the job at hand, which is marketing and selling your product. Doing logistics in the Caribbean is evolving. We started at a point where there was little or nothing by air between Caribbean islands. And slowly but surely, there are efforts in place to change this. However, there are standards of operations that must be followed. We call them SOPs or Standard Operating Procedures. There are certification levels that logistics companies must have and we generally recommend you must have either some affiliation to IATA uh, FMC which is the Federal Maritime Commission or the TSA in order to effectively do logistics in the Caribbean you are going to require a cargo hub and I can tell you from a swift pack standpoint our cargo hub operation is in Barbados, and we intend very soon to expand and make a big announcement on that cargo hub operation. And last but not least, the importance of software. We cannot overemphasize the importance of software and software management in logistics. I can tell you from our standpoint that we have spent up to 700,000 US dollars already in software development. And we are not done. We currently have a software team of about six spread throughout the world, some in the US, some in India, a couple in the Caribbean, who are constantly working on software development. Um, so our software is a work in progress as we, as we speak. Um, and alongside that, we need to develop, and we have developed, um, mobile app application to work and make software availability enhanced and available to all in the, in, in the process. So it is very important that software play a critical role or otherwise you're going to lose it eventually. I can tell you from our, from our warehousing operation, we use our software for pickup at someone's door. We use it for receiving in the warehouse. It is used for warehousing and storage. 
It is used for cargo handling and tracking. It is also used for accounting, card processing. We also offer repacking and consolidation services, and that software provides the ability to do that. It provides all the documentation for shipping, and it provides, very importantly, POD, proof of delivery. Some of the persons in the Caribbean will soon see that once something is delivered from SWIFT back, they will be required to provide a signature um, or the person who delivers that um, package will put in the name of a person, um, but we, we actually believe in having someone sign. Um, we are moving to the point where the services that are offered in the Caribbean should be no different than the services offered in the USA by the major players in this industry. We are also in the process of, ens of ensuring that the service times in the Caribbean are actually as good as or better than service levels in the USA. I can tell you that soon, SWIFTPAC will offer same-day services between some Caribbean countries. Now, a lot of what I'm saying here is dependent on, of course, governments and how soon they're willing to give us permissions to operate and so on and so forth, the regulatory framework. But very, very soon, and based on investments that we have made and continue to make, we are planning to provide not only same day and next day service, but we are also planning to provide customers the ability to have an organized ocean transport service. And I want to touch on ocean transport in particular. Right now, what uh, do we have? Ricardo, Ricardo, I don't want yeah. to interrupt you. Um, I apologize, but we are running out of time. I think it's very important what you're saying about ocean, ocean transportation because there have been questions about using schooners. But I'm going to only give you about another three minutes, if you could talk about that. Well, I'm just going to wrap up anyway. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so Thank much. You. So I'm making the point of ocean transport. In particular, persons in the Caribbean do not fully comprehend how ocean transport works. And it is critical that we discuss that before I leave. We have schooners moving between the islands, and they, they provide a very valuable service. However, we also have the, inter, the international carriers, as we put them, who comes into the Caribbean weekly and move along a particular route. They only provide full container loads. So we depend on our schooners. But our schooners, if you call them today and ask what's the price per cubic foot to move something from St. Vincent to Barbados or St. Vincent to Trinidad, they are unable to give you a price per cubic foot. They will basically say, oh, we charge $10 for a box or $60 for this or whatever. They, they are not set up as other carriers are. And this is where it is critical that we start working with these carriers and we start understanding and putting a new a new arrangement in place so that when, as an e-commerce customer, you have 10 pounds to ship,
between one island and the other, you can get a rate so that you can then ensure that your product pricing is done properly. And so it is very important that ocean carriage be organized in such a way. And like air products, that customers can use them and use them effectively. And I think basically this is where I would stop. Let me thank you for the opportunity. And I look forward to seeing a lot more business in the region. We are anxious and, and willing to help in every single way to ensure that logistics in the region is vastly in, improved over the next couple of months. Fantastic. Thank you Thank so you. much. You've packed, in, you've packed in quite a bit of information there, and we have quite a few questions that have come in directly for you, but we're going to leave those until the okay. end because we still have one other presenter. Okay. We really want to make sure that our next presenter gets some time to 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 um to to deliver his message as well. All right, but before we do, we're going to ask the audience um, if you could turn your attention to the next slide, which um, where we're looking now at how you are currently delivering your orders. We wanna we wanna collect that bit of information from you because that will help our next presenter, Andre. Um, to better understand who he's talking to. So if you can right now take our survey, um, tell us whether you are using a customer pickup, whether it's the local post office, whether you're using a local or international courier, whether you're delivering them yourself or whether you, you are using none of the above methods to, to deliver your orders. Um, not sure how none of the above would be relevant, but 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 just in case you're not yet into into delivery and and you want to, I guess this will tell him how many people need uh, need options. You know, have a have a look. Um, it's a multiple choice answer, so so you have to choose one, guys. Um, let us know what you're what you're doing, um, so that we can we can be best meet your needs. Um, and well, so that the, the next presenter can know how to present. I'm understanding from our, our, our production team that you are able to make more than one selection. Thank you for that. All right, let me give you a and minute. If I may say in the meantime, if I may say in the Go meantime, ahead, um, Suzette, um, we kind of touched on a few things, right? So when you look at, I've had several conversations with UPS, FedEx, DHL. They're mostly not interested in moving products out of the Caribbean. Their interest is strictly in bringing products into the Caribbean or else they would have lowered their rates. So we have to look at policies that helps to direct uh, their, their business. Two, the Jamaica Post Office and uh, TNT Post, are doing excellent jobs in moving products out of the region. So we, you could look at those. And in terms of policy, our leaders have to look at the customs duties as opposed to the benefits of e-commerce and make policies that guides that. Because e-commerce, the benefits of e-commerce go way beyond just bringing in revenue. It, it's job creation as well. So we have to look at those policies as well and see how well we can tailor those to support e-commerce because the benefits are endless. Fantastic, Gilbert. Maybe you can stick around as we look at the um, look at the poll results. Thank you very much for responding. And so, what we're seeing here Absolutely. is that a lot of our a lot of our respondents are actually delivering. Their, their products themselves. Um, there are about 39.5% of, of our respondents who are doing that. Then we have 30% of our respondents who do who offer customer pickup. And I guess that 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 is probably something that you you do a lot. We're seeing a lot of that today because of coronavirus. 30% um, of our, our respondents um, are doing local and international courier, 
But it's very interesting to see that 80% are doing local post office. Um, very, very interesting. And of course, we have 18% who have a very diversified platform and are doing all of the above. Um, Andre, I want to I want to turn over to you now um, to to take us through a conversation about the findings from the the poll, but also from the work that you do. All right, thank you so much, Suzette. I'm hoping that I'm being heard clearly. All right, so um, I'm talking to you about Brata Box and Co., which is a company that Orlando Owen and myself formed uh, in 2015. Um, my, my slides are very few, and I'll be going over the background to my company, um, how we shipped in the beginning, what challenge arose out of starting to ship, and the solution that we came up on, and the results of implementing that solution. Now, a little bit about the background of Brata Box. In 2000. 14, I was living overseas in South Africa, and I was working on a research project that allowed me to see um, up close, in a way that I hadn't seen in my own country, um, how much people rely on this cash transfer that the government was giving. And one of the things that we noticed was that there were some, com some families that only relied on the cash transfer, and they were only able to do so much for, their, for the children and the, the parents and the elderly that lived in that family. And there were some families that we were studying that also supplemented their cash transfers with some sort of economic activity of their own. Um, and largely that meant buying some goods and going into town and selling them or some other kind of trade. And those families, they actually had slightly better health outcomes as a result of supplementing the reliance on cash transfers. And that got my head thinking, right? So instead of following the path of um, proposing that aid be the route to helping families come out of abject poverty, it, um, it, it arose to me that there is a role for economic empowerment through the production of goods and services. And in some roundabout way, that led to Brata Box & Co., which has to do with taking handmade products made by local artisans, things that look nice, they're pretty, People think that they are of value when it comes to gift giving. Curate them along with other items, put them in a gift box that people um, want to keep for a long time, and then say, here, here's a gift box. And um, that's the basis of the company. And so Brother Box & Co, since 2015, when we started, we've been in partnership with um, ceramics, artists, people who make clothing, food items, um, skincare products, whatever, whatever we've decided will come together to make a, a nice gift box. Those items have been the contents in our gift boxes. We've 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 been very deliberate about recognizing the 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 importance of paying a fair price for items, what impact that has on individual families, and so we make sure that that comes across in the way that we design our gifts. All right, but with something that's as bespoke as a gift box, we recognize that we needed to keep our hands on the process, right? Um, we've learned a lot about sending off to warehouses so that someone can pick and pack, but for the kind of product that we make, that kind of hands-on element is very inimical to the quality of the product that we are producing. So we didn't want to give that, that part away. Um, but we started out recognizing that we would be ordering the items in very small batches from our artisans and makers. We'd be storing them in one location, and we'd be doing the pick and, picking and packing and making our gift boxes ourselves. Um, our initial shipping process wasn't very organized. Um, in terms of not written down, kind of like common sense approach to, to shipping, using the post office, not having any established relationships, using um, a service that we have in Jamaica called Nuts for the Express, which isn't the most convenient because it doesn't go directly to the home of the, of the consumer. 
it goes to one of the depots that Nostrad Express um, finalizes at. Um, but that was a cost-effective option, and we utilized it in the beginning. We also didn't do much in terms of guaranteeing delivery times. Um, it would be almost understood that, you know, when your order is made by the website or by our social commerce through, like, Instagram or something like that, that um, we would get to it as soon as possible. We would definitely let you know that we've gotten your order, um, but there wasn't an insistence that your order will get to you in two days because that would be a little problematic to make that guarantee if there wasn't a way to fulfill that. Um, that's basically how we got started. I also want to note that there are a few good instances of miscalculating our shipping cost. And so we would have something that we need to ship overseas. We would assume that it would cost no more than $20 to ship this wooden box with ceramics and food products and, you know, all these things add weight to the box. Um, and then we have to make sure it's properly insulated. So we're adding more paper, more padding, and then we are making sure that it meets the guidelines for shipping by the post office. So we're wrapping brown paper over the box. Um, and these things add up. And so we end up with the cost of shipping exceeding what the customer has been asked to pay. And we have to take that out of the profit margin for the for the product. Um, so that clearly isn't a sustainable way of going about shipping. And so it allowed us to define the challenge. So the definition of our challenge emerged as this. In addition to our retail customers, and these are the customers that we classify as buying directly from our website or from social media. They're usually just buying one gift box at a time or one subscription box at a time. They have a specific, they presented a specific set of challenges that we needed to address. And they also had another customer segment that grew in importance or grew in, grew in, in proportion of, of orders and those, those customers are our corporate customers that they make an order and they're buying multiple copies of the same box and they're getting um, a large amount of these. And so we had to have a strategy that allowed us to send multiple copies of a gift box to a customer and individual boxes to many customers. Um, and uh, recognizing that the website that we're using, which we are based on Squarespace, and the fact that there are tools that are meant to make shipping and distribution and fulfillment easy if you're using one of these um, out-of-the-box solutions, they don't necessarily work for non-US based businesses, which is you know, the group of us that we're talking to right now. Um, so we identified that as our challenge, and then we set about to find a way around it. And uh, this had to start with um, a lot of research and a lot of taking the step to try something and see if it worked or not. And this, this allowed us to think of the shipping and distribution aspect of running Box and Co. as an experiment within the broader experiment of being an e-commerce service provider. So um, research is going to be pretty far and wide and accessible to all of us once we have an internet connection and we know how to type into Google. But the thing with research is we're going to find a lot of um, answers that aren't necessarily based in our Caribbean context. So just be mindful of that. And when you find an answer that doesn't seem to automatically translate to running your business from Jamaica, don't be afraid to reach out and find out if there is a way for said company to, to still provide you with a solution that works for you. Case in point, in recognizing that there is a part of the process where we are looking to find the cheapest um, the cheapest cost of sending a, a box or a package 
from Jamaica to the United States, it would, on the surface of things, a service like ShipStation would allow you to create an account um, and put in the, the customer's address. And then based on where the package is being picked up, they will negotiate rates between the top shipping providers in the United States and give you a solution. No, that doesn't translate immediately to a business that is based outside of the United States. But if we have certain things in place, for instance, if we decided to send a bulk of our products to a Miami warehouse, and something that we figured out or we learned in researching is that a lot of these warehouses that allow the freight forwarding companies to allow shoppers to buy online and send them to a warehouse in Miami and then they are brought in um, in bulk to Jamaica or to other countries, these same companies allow you to send the bulk of your products to them. You give them instructions as to how they are to package them and send them out when orders come and you're able to have at a very minimal cost um, some of your products in another space that allows you to take advantage of a service like ShipStation to get a low um, ticket price for the for the cost of shipping onward to your customer. And that's something that you have to learn by, you know, checking to see if you can have a work around that. Um, another thing that emerged as a solution is um, having conversation with the international shippers or the courier services that can take your products to the uh, to the end user that you have as your customer. In our case, we had a conversation with DHL that frankly surprised us. Um, I hear a lot about the cost of using a service like DHL and and UPS, and it is quite daunting at the outset. But what I learned from going in, bringing my boxes, demonstrating that you know we want to have as many of these things that are made by local artisans get to members of the diaspora and other people who love Jamaica. And I was surprised at the discount that was offered. Um, in one instance, it started at fifty percent off their ticketed price, and over time that discount has increased. Um, so my suggestion is if you do have a, a product that will be consistently shipped and there are service providers in your, in your location, then don't be afraid to go to them, even if you might be a small entity, to say, I'd like to have an account and I'd like to get this amount of discount because I expect to do this amount of business. And you may end up with a favorable outcome. All right. Um, another part of the solution here has to do with something that um, was mentioned earlier um, in terms of creating standard operating procedures that cover various scenarios for shipping. I talked about shipping to our corporate customers that order in bulk and shipping to our retail customers that order one or two items at a time. Having a strategy that says when an order comes in and it meets this particular criteria um, or these particular criteria, then we will activate this particular operating procedure. And that helps to reduce stress, to make sure that um, anyone who is working that day is able to move forward the shipping. And a critical thing for us is recognizing that we have to rely on this semi-automated, semi-manual version of getting our orders in and translating them or directing them toward the um, shipping solution that works for that particular order and know that that is going to be our reality for a little longer until we are at a point where it is cost-effective to um, move to an entirely automated system and um, and that does not um, reduce the quality of presentation that is a big part of our product. So I want to, to drive home that there may be a point in your business's growth where um, in your business's growth where you have to 
decide if moving to a third party logistics provider or keeping things semi manual, semi automated will work in your favor. All right. Um, here's a screen grab of the checkout page from Brotterbox and Co. We currently have to put in rules in terms of the shipping destinations. Depending on the address that you put in, you will get a different rate. And that just has to be the case in order to give our end customers the most accurate um, shipping shipping quote so that there isn't a case where we are absorbing too much of the cost of shipping. What we found with our customers is through communicating the value of what our product is and the fact that we're not trying to compete on cost, they understand and they also know that our products are coming from Jamaica. The cost of shipping, while it might not be um, something that you're willing to, to, to undertake in a general sense, it usually goes by without a lot of question from um, the customers that are motivated to purchase. I am aware, though, that there is um, it could be a lot cheaper, and that's something that we hope to, um, to, 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 to rectify. And then our final slide seeks to um, some of the things that I've already mentioned, right? The fact that you have to view shipping and distribution as an experiment within your business and an experiment that will have inputs and will vary depending on the, um, the different conditions that you apply to it. So once you do that and pay attention and document, you might be able to come out with standard operating procedures that take away the hassle and the stress of dealing with um, shipping on a day-to-day -day basis. It's something that we're still figuring out. Um, the fact that we're asked to talk about our, our business operations to the rest of you um, participants in this, in this webinar is, um, is a very humbling opportunity, and we're grateful to just share what we've come up with Interestingly, um, I'm available to go into more detail as I recognize that my time is up because of you know just so much information has been poured into our webinar so far. But you can head over to my personal um, website, which is andrerob.com, and from there you're able to um, see more information on our playbook for shipping. Um, send me a message so that I can be in touch with you directly. And because Brotterbox & Co. has benefited from the input of organizations and individuals, and, that has, and that's the only reason why we're at this point, I'm more than happy to provide help and feedback to others that may have questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, uh, sharing your experience, we, we, we know that a lot of persons benefited from that. But before you go, there was one question that I thought was very relevant for you. Um, and so I'd love if you could just address the issue um, of, you know, packaging of merchandise in a sustainable manner. Can, it, can that be taken into consideration? How can, how can an environmentally friendly packaging material um, be used and help you in, in not only your presentation to, to the customer, but also in your, your co corporate social responsibility to, to sustain the planet. And, and then they talked a little bit about um, the use of plastic and styrofoam in packaging and how that can be minimized to, to help you in terms of your costs, because, because costs are based on not only the weight, but also the size of your package. Um, is there any way that you can, you know, what, what's been your experience? And, and just give us three quick things that you want people to take away from this session in terms of packaging for shipping. All right. Um, I think having a sustainable outlook uh, or sustainability outlook is going to be important to determining what products you use to provide with insulation for whatever you're shipping. So that starts from just knowing that there is an important um, decision to be made about whether you go with um, plastic bubbles, 
versus um, using paper, right? Um, once you determine that you want to have your business be on the road towards um, promoting sustainability, then you're going to find the solutions that allow that to happen. Um, for us, we use like um, paper inside the box to ensure that the they will use paper on the outside of the box for the boxes that are sent, um, you know, like that has a lot of traveling to do. So I'd say you determine what will become your standard for adding insulating material. And if that means additional costs, then find a way to communicate that in the story of your product and your business so that individuals that are purchasing don't question um, all of these little steps. I follow a bunch of podcasts, and one of them is by a um, a company called Lumi, and they have been insisting on the podcast is called Well Made, and they talk about how direct to consumer companies like what we have and what a lot of us have have a role to play in making sure that your packaging is transparent and sustainable. So I would recommend people check out. Well Made, wherever you get your podcasts, or Lumi.com, if they have um, an interest in looking at sustainable or sustainability in terms of packaging. And in terms of three takeaways, I think the first one is determining your mindset around sustainability. Have principles as to how you define that. Um, ensuring that you can say to anyone who asks you that you are engaging in thoughtful sustainability for these reasons. To um, understand that good sustainability comes at a cost and find a way to communicate that in your product story so that it does not get questioned by your end users. And your end users may end, might end up becoming your end users because of the importance that you place on that part of the story. And thirdly is um, not being afraid to you know, find the material anywhere in the world find cost-effective ways of getting them to you or creating them using local resources. One of the things that I like to do is, because we make wooden boxes, the shavings from the um, from the wood can be repurposed and used in very interesting ways. So once you have decided that you want to do this, you can find strategies and solutions. Perfect. Thank you so much. That was very insightful. All right, we have run out of time, um, as seems to be the situation every week. No matter how hard we try, there is just so much information. We want to thank um, our three panelists. But before we go, I wanted to quickly, I know there the questions are still coming in fast and furious. And unfortunately, we don't have we don't have the time to answer all of them. Well, we don't have any more time. I want to leave the last um, word to Gilbert. Um, if he would like to wrap up before before we um, we close out today's session. All right, thanks, Suzette. Again, I, we have to thank everyone for taking the, the time out to listen to our, our webinar. I hope you guys learned a lot. We are still available to provide you with any sort of help and support that you need. That's what we do at Carib Export and at Edmonds. You just reach out to us at any time with your questions, suggestions, because other people can learn from what you know as well. Um, on the question of sustainability, it is not a cost. It's an investment, and you use it to sell your products. There are a lot of people, and the people that you, that you really want to appeal to who can afford it would pay for that packaging because it's sustainable. And you have to put it into costing on your product. It's an investment. Go with sustainable development. As I said before, we in the Caribbean have such an advantage because of where we are in the e-commerce world. We can make these decisions now because we're now jumping into it. And as Andre mentioned, there are a number of things that you can use using coconut fiber as packaging works. So there you are supporting another local industry. We don't waste anything. We can't afford to waste anything in the region. Okay. Um, so this, these sessions have been really, really good for us in terms of our ability to relay information that previously would have been difficult to come by. We are happy to serve you. Again, thanks, Suzette, for giving us this opportunity. Thanks for all our panelists who came on with us over the last couple of weeks. We really appreciate your experience and how you've translated that information in a consumable manner to our small businesses. 
right again thank you very much Thanks to you as well, um, and thanks to our audience. Um, the very last thing I want to I see think you to everyone. Um, yeah. No, I'm not. Are you not hearing me? I'm hearing you. All right. Are you are you hearing me now? Yes. I hope so. All right. Yes. All yes, right. I am. All right. Fantastic. I I I needed to refresh there. Sorry about that, colleagues. All right. So we have come to the end of our program, but I wanted to quickly tell you about the next steps. I think it's important for you to know that Caribbean Export will not be leaving things here. We are not just doing four webinars and then moving on. What we are doing right now is we're in the process of planning. So we've brought together our main presenters from the one that we spoke to um, during our very first episode um, from the e-commerce training academy. Um, we've brought Ethniv and we have sat down and we have talked about next steps. So some of the things that we're hoping to do going forward, we're gonna have live training sessions. These will be six hour intensive sessions, almost like boot camps where we will be speaking with a smaller group of people. So we have had for each of our sessions over 300 persons with lots of questions. But we're not able to take all those questions at, you know, during our, our hour and something. So we're gonna have live training sessions where you're taken through the process during six hours. Um, it's our intensive. And then you are able to build your own store and that will come through the training academy and sitting through the 21 day challenge. And then there are going to be business advisory services or a help desk, which will be provided. These are all things that are currently being put in place and you'll be hearing a little bit more from us in the next, um, in the next couple of days. And of course, we spoke last week about the demonstration projects courtesy of CXP, where they say that they will take four companies in the Caribbean They'll help you set up your e-commerce platform. They'll walk you through the process. They'll hold your hand and you will be our test cases that we can show to the rest of the Caribbean that this thing works and that we can take a business from no e-commerce to full e-commerce and generating significant revenues. All right, take a look at this. This entire webinar will be posted on our on our um, platform on Caribbean Exports website. Um, we look forward forward to seeing and interacting with you. Thank you very much for your time and for giving us even extra time. Um, all the best in your business and please know that Caribbean Export is here for you. Take care. Bye-bye.